Good morning, everyone. We're just going to wait a couple of minutes um, until the numbers start leveling out as participants get led into the to the meeting. Muy buenos días a todos. Vamos a esperar un par de minutos en lo que ingresan más personas a la reunión. Okay, let's get started. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us today for our Electric Bicycle Incentives Project Workgroup. My name is Aria Berliner, and I am the staff lead over the Electric Bicycle Incentives Project. I am joined today by Lisa McCumber, manager over the funding plan, the Clean Vehicle Rebate Project, and the Electric Bicycle Incentives Project. This meeting is a continuation of the August 24th, 2022 workgroup. Before we get started, I wanted, I wanted to go over some logistics for today's, today's discussion. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. We anticipate a copy of the recording will be, made, will be made available on the Low Carbon Transportation Investments and Air Quality Improvement Program Meetings and Workshops page, webpage in approximately two weeks. Materials for today's work group are available on the same web page, and a link to these materials has been dropped in the Zoom chat. Additionally, today's meeting is being translated live in Spanish and American Sign Language. In a little bit, you will be able to access the interpretation button at the bottom of the screen. For Spanish speakers, please join the Spanish channel, and the meeting will be translated into Spanish. Please be mindful when speaking so that the interpreters can translate what you're saying. You do not need to speak super slow, but we ask that you do not speak super fast. We will be leveraging Zoom's raised hand feature to facilitate comments and questions. There will not be a Q&A box for today's meeting. Please remember to state your name and affiliation when making a comment or asking a question. If there are Zoom disruptions for any reason, including malicious intent, we will immediately end today's meeting and send out another notice to reschedule. And lastly, we are unable to allow anonymous meeting participants for security reasons. Please make sure your name is clear on the Zoom platform. If you have called in, we will adjust your phone number and call on you if you raise your hand based on the last four digits of your number. Aldo, can you please translate in Spanish? Yes, of course. Thank you so much. Muy buenas tardes. Muy buenos días a todos ustedes. Gracias por estar presente el día de hoy. Esta reunión se está, estará proporcionando en inglés. Sin embargo, estaremos ofreciendo servicios de interpretación. Eh, brevemente, en un momento, usted va a ver en la parte inferior de su pantalla un icono en forma de un mundo. Cuando aparezca ese icono, favor de presionarlo escoger el idioma de su preferencia y así de esa manera escuchará la interpretación en vivo. Si tiene algún problema, favor de alzar su mano o escribirlo en el chat y con mucho gusto lo estaremos apoyando. Gracias por estar aquí presente y que tenga una buena reunión. You may continue, Aria. Thank you. Thanks. Now we will move on um, to discussing the agenda. Today's agenda is as follows. We'll talk about policy considerations, including income eligibility, incentive amounts, 
and, and eligible electric bicycles. We will present all slides and then I'll open it up for, com for questions and comments. After we finish discussing policy considerations, I'll provide a brief timeline. I'll provide a brief, brief timeline. I'll then open it up for more discussion and close with next steps. Okay. Policy considerations. Um, since we spoke at length about income limits at the August 24th work group, this will be a short reminder of what we are proposing for this project. We are proposing to align income eligibility limits with the clean vehicle rebate projects, increased rebate, clean cars for all, and financing assistance, which means an income limit of 400% of the federal poverty limit. This means for a family of four, in order to be eligible to receive an e-bike incentive, their income would have to be $111,000 or less. For an individual, that number is about $54,000. A link to the federal poverty limit table has been posted in the chat. Please note that you will that you'll have to look at the last column on the right to see the 400% limits. We posed a couple of questions last time regarding whether or not we whether or not we provide an extra amount of money to people living in disadvantaged communities or with incomes below 225% FPL. We want to hear from you. Lisa, can you show the first question? You should now be seeing a poll with, um, with this question. Should CARD provide a larger incentive for participants with a lower income threshold below 225% of the federal poverty limit or an applicant that lives in a disadvantaged community as defined by Cal and Virus Screen? I'll leave that open for another minute. Lisa, let's go ahead and close that poll as I move on to incentive amounts. Now I'd like to discuss incentive amounts. Similar to other programs, we propose starting off with a base amount. Based on discussions with other e-bike project program administrators, we're suggesting a $750 incentive. We feel that this may be the right amount, but what do you think? We have another poll for you to answer. Lisa, can you show the next question? I'll leave that up as well for a minute. Okay, Lisa, please close that question. We also understand that cargo bikes, as well as adaptive and recumbent e-bikes, are significantly more expensive than a standard commuter or hybrid bike, which is why we would also propose an additional $750 for those types of bikes. Like before, we want to get your input. Lisa, can you show the next question? I'll once again give everyone a minute to answer. Thank you, Lisa, if you can close that question. Lastly, we would, like to we would like to consider additional funding for either individuals with incomes under 225% of the federal poverty limit or those living in a disadvantaged community. Like before, we wanna get your input. Lisa, can you show the last question? In this poll, you are able to vote on a suggested amount. We ask that you do so at this time. And as before, I will leave it open for a minute.
Okay, Lisa, if you can close it, that'd be great. Bike eligibility. We are proposing to include class one and class two e-bikes, but exclude class three e-bikes. This is going to be a new program and there's a lot of controversy around class three e-bikes and their safety as it, relates to, as it relates to other cyclists as well as pedestrians. Next slide. Um, participating retailers. We understand the chain, the chain supply struggles that e-bike manufacturers and most industries have experienced throughout, um, throughout the pandemic. In one of the first work groups for this project, we discussed limiting retailer participation to only local bike shops, but heard from a lot of you that we should include e-bike, include online e-bike retailers. As a result, staff is suggesting that we work with both local bike shops and online e-bike retailers with a physical pre pre presence in California. By physical pre presence, we mean that there is either a physical shop that their manufacturing is done in California or that they have a corporate office in California. Now that we've gone through all the topics, I would like to open it up for questions. Bianca, are there any raised hands? Thank you, Ari. I guess there are. Um, the first one is Tom Lent. Tom, I'm opening up your line now. Tom, can you hear me? Tom, you'll need to unmute yourself on your end as well. And so I do not have a question yet at this time. That was uh, that must have been an error of raising my hand. Sorry. Gotcha. <laughs> no worries. Thanks, Tom. The next person is Mark Ruth. Mark, I've opened up your line. Thank you. So I've got an immediate two questions here or two comments here first of all going back a couple of slides the uh, idea of um, top speed the top speed one actually um, so the thing is that I wouldn't want to exclude the class three because the way that we can really get people out of cars in, on, on mass is to provide elevated ultralight structure, elevated guideways for bicycles and pedestrians and miscellaneous mobility devices. And the bike, excuse me. And the bicycles should be separated between fast and slow. In other words, athletes um, go probably twice the speed of people who are not that way. And electric bicycles and athletes are probably quite compatible. So I would have separate lanes for people who are average to slow. And uh, so that, for instance, they're not frightened or, or startled by someone speeding by them. And uh, for uh, fast, fast ones. And one of the key issues here is that an elevated bicycle path allows you to go past stop signs and stop lights. So when I was a kid, I bicycled 1.7 miles to school and I passed many intersections and there weren't stop signs for me. Um, but if there were, I would uh, turn to the right, go across turn, and go back up. It was, I would just basically detour around the intersection and come back and keep, keep my momentum up because starting up from a stop that many times would drain my energy quickly, all right? So it's important to allow people to purchase something with that. You might want to put some controls in that can be turned off when they're in a, a, a place where it uh, doesn't create a problem for them to be going fast, like such an environment. But you want to be able to, and you want to be able to enable people to, to take max advantage of that. So for instance, if someone is going 25, 30 miles an hour, um, and they didn't have any stop signs, signs or stoplights, they could go diagonally across San Francisco in 15 or 20 minutes. And that would be an effective commute. They could go across the bay, San Francisco Bay. 
um, on 92 or or on a separate on I mean not 92 but the the Dumbarton on you know we could make where the Dumbarton rail bridge is we could make bi-direction you know two-way heavy rail and above that we get a two-way bi-directional group rapid transit and and above that we could have to the fast and slow bike lanes and above that we could have pedestrians and miscellaneous mobility device paths and above that a solar canopy that powers the group rapid transit so that's the design i've been working on for quite a while thanks mark for your comments thank you mark um the next person on the list is uh Piet, I've opened your line. Hi, this is Piet Ken with Ecology Action. Um, my comment was about the criteria for um, vendors. So the slide that had the online vendors. So I was curious to know how many vendors would meet that criteria of online who has a physical store um, front, California manufacturing based in corporate office in California. Do you, do you have that information? Um, thanks, Piet. We we don't actually, but it's not an and, it's an or. So I, I do want to I do want to be I do want to be clear on that that they do not have to have all three. They just need to have one. Okay, thanks. Um, great. And then the other question I had um, just quickly is for the type of um, electric bikes to be included in this program or excluded. Um, is there talk about like, you know, since this program is geared towards getting people out of their cars um, and using um, electric bikes as an alternative form of transportation or sustainable form of transportation, would would um, this program, how would it treat not electric mountain bikes and electric, you know, recreational bikes? That's not something we've really um, dove into yet, um, but it is, once we have, um, I think some of these basics down will get into more of the the more nitty gritty and the details. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Piet. Thank you, um, Jonathan. I'm opening your line. Hey there, thank you for this presentation. Um, I had a couple questions. I was one, and I apologize if you said this, but what data? Are you basing the restriction or the proposed restriction on class three e-bikes on? Is there data out there that I can look at? Um, there's no data per se. It's um more of something that we've we've thought of, um, we've we've talked about internally. It's um it's it's just a suggestion, and that's sort of the purpose of this work group is to take to get feedback from the public and we've we would make a more informed decision that way. We do know that um, there are age restrictions when it comes to e-bike, um, to class three e-bikes. And so that is something that we have considered um, while when making this proposal. Okay, I'd like to suggest more data collection on actual uh, potential conflicts with other cyclists and pedestrians. I mean, I've heard that concern too, but I would I would like to actually see some data that indicates that class threes are actually more dangerous than a class two. Um, the other comment, I guess, is just kind of a concern about having a barrier to folks buying an e-bike um, with the local provision only. Um, you know, I would just say lower the barriers in that way, lower the criteria and the hoops people have to jump through to be eligible. Um, so sorry for not phrasing that as a question, but just well, a suggestion. No, that's fine. That's actually, this is actually the the second or third time I've heard that. And can you explain what you mean by local barriers? Cause this is, this will be a statewide program. There, there, there's no um, eligibility requirements based on where you live in the state of California, just that you live in California. Um, specifically with the retailers, I'm thinking, you know, I'll just use Rad Power. I'm sure they do have a local office and they do have a California presence, but let's assume that they don't. You know, that's the most, probably the most popular online retailer. We even have a local e-bike retailer in Santa Cruz. They make them in Santa Cruz, but they don't sell them. They sell them exclusively online. So there's just all those nuances. And I, I just kind of personally think adding more restrictions on that is not going to be productive in addressing 
our TDM goals and the climate emergency. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Um, our next person would be Tina Butler. Tina, I've opened up your line. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm Tina Butler from Gazelle. Um, I yeah wanted to also just, uh, I guess, sound a vote in support of revisiting the class three conversation, primarily for if this is really a commute vehicle and some people are needing to travel you know, longer distances, having a bike that can go a bit faster and cover that distance to make a car commute and an e-bike commute be comparable in terms of time, I think has value. I understand the concerns around mixed use paths with controlled speed limits, um, et cetera, but just wanted to, to do another vote for, for reconsidering that decision. And then on the local retailer front, um, I think one of the concerns I have and have experienced firsthand is people who have bought bikes online and then they have can't find a local bike shop that's willing to service the bike due to safety concerns or proprietary parts that are hard to get. So I think my concern with just a corporate office as a as a qualifier for inclusion in the program is that you can't take a bike to get repaired at a corporate office. And if no local bike shop will touch it, you've just spent a lot of money on something that is now a burden. So I would yeah vote heavily for something that is either sold through local retailers and will be serviced through local retailers. Um, or is manufactured in California. That's all. Thank you, Tina. Thank you. Um, our next speaker will be Duane Strauser. Or Duane? Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, so Duane Strasser, and uh, I've got kind of a varied background being I'm with the Northern Sierra Air Quality Management District now. Uh, but my wife and I owned one of the top bicycle retail shops for 25 years in Nevada City, California. So we have vast experience on both sides of this. Um, and we were kind of at the ground floor with Specialized and Trek when the first e-bikes came out and actually helped uh, give input on design factors back in the day. So my concern here looking at this now, and I'm new to your group, obviously, is that uh, class three being excluded, for example, that's got to be between 60 and 70 percent of the retail models of bikes being sold. Most retailers are focused on pedal assist only. They are not selling uh, class two type bikes with throttles included. Um, so that the, the class two is probably the smallest uh, percentage of models of styles being sold, at least in retail outlets right now. Class three is definitely the most popular. The speed limit situation, uh, a couple of the other commenters that make you know, uh, suggestions on looking for more data, I would agree on that, because all this means is 20 miles of um, support speed to the rider. The rider can still do 28, 30, 35 miles per hour. Um, that's just assisted speed. Um, most of us that are avid cyclists down, for example, on the American River bike path uh, are on average, as an athletic cyclist, non-e-bike cyclists are still doing 22 to 23, even though the speed limit is 15, and that's done very safely. Um, so it's just like driving. It comes down to the driver. So I don't think speed should be a limitation mark on um, uh, possible exclusion. Uh, if you exclude class three, you're, you're really de-incentivizing the majority of, of potential um, customer base with e-bikes. We also, separate from commute factors, see a huge percentage of um, seniors, um, retirees that are getting back into cycling because of e-bikes, especially in our uh, geography up here with the hilly climate. Um, they can't ride their, their standard non-e-bikes anymore. They simply have given it up. So they're getting back into it, which helps the overall health um, of our community, of our citizens. And a lot of the folks that are buying bikes like this now for commute use, whether it's to work, whether it's to a college or high school class, are then also using the bikes on the weekends for recreational use. That's where class three, again, is very popular. Um, I also appreciate the comments. Um, we, we've seen a huge influx of, of low par, low quality e-bikes being purchased by customers via online. Um, they then bring it to our shop and we simply cannot source parts and, and these bikes fall apart. They're going into the landfill within six months. Uh, it, it's terrible, um, high cost, whereas any of the bikes from a legitimate manufacturing source, uh, whether it's a bicycle retail source such as Trek or Specialized or Giant or Scott, whomever, 
Um, those are quality products. They can be purchased and then supported and maintained through a local bicycle shop. Um, RAD, R-A-D, we cannot sell those uh, as a brick and mortar shop, but that's a quality product that they ship to our store to have assembled for the customer. So then therefore they still have um, you know, support, mechanical support, physical support. Uh, so I would say, let's be very careful on incentivizing people to buy something from an unknown source online. Um, it gets assembled once at the shop. And then again, like I said, they, they literally are a very subpar product that fall apart. Um, it does none of us any good. And that person has used up their credit um, you know, and, and they're done. Um, so I hope to get a little more involved in this group and get up to speed with you guys. But I would say uh, I do appreciate this meeting. But some of these limitations do worry me, especially the class three, um, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Duane. Um, our next raised hand is Carlene Cullen. Uh, Carlene, I've opened your line. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I'm with Cool the Earth and uh, Ride and Drive Clean. We're a large collaboration in the Bay Area promoting uh, e-mobility, so e-bikes and uh, EVs. Um, and I have several questions. First of all, I just wanna really give strong support that class three uh, is allowed as part of this. Um, I think you've heard a lot of the arguments and I support all of those. Um, my concern is about class two with the throttle uh, and throttle only bikes. Um, and those seem to be, uh, have, more, have more problems in the Bay Area in terms of safety. Uh, in particular, um, I'm concerned about whether uh, people under 16 years old might need to have some sort of certification or training um, before they are allowed to use e-bikes. Uh, in particular, if class two throttle is going to remain eligible, um, we see lots of problems with uh, younger, younger folk who really uh, don't have experience and um, with these sorts of uh, throttle uh, bikes. And, and we think that there needs to be some sort of certification or training. Um, additionally, I think overall training uh, for just bike riders, but especially e-bike riders. I've been an e-bike rider for about four years. Um, and there's definitely uh, folks out there who will you know, pass you even if you're uh, going at 20 miles an hour. And I think we just need to really uh, enforce that people take some sort of uh, understand at least that they need to uh, comply with the, the rules of the road. So um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carlene. Um, our next um, raised hand is Jeremy Teeter. Jeremy, Jeremy Teeter. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Jeremy Teeter with the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. And uh, I just want to support the comments about um, the eligibility of the electric bicycle class three. Um, the point that I specifically wanted to make was in regards to disadvantaged communities, um, spe <clears throat> excuse me, specifically here in the Bay Area in San Francisco and Oakland, uh, Bayview and West Oakland are uh, a bit removed from the city center where the commerce takes place. So if we're looking to incentivize disadvantaged community members to get on electric bicycles, I believe that having a class three bicycle that can move them quickly through the city would be uh, a great advantage. I just want to highlight that point. So thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sophia. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. Oh, well, we could. Um, Bianca, it looks like Sophia has been remuted. Oh. Hello? Hi, we can Hi. hear you. Perfect. Um, yes, my name is Sofia Afikova. I'm with the Coalition for Clean Air, and I actually wanted to speak on the income eligibility requirement. Uh, so we would like to request that that uh, income limit is actually lowered to 300% of FPL. And the reasons for that are, first of all, you say uh, the 400% limit was because it would comply with Clean Cars for All and similar uh, transportation equity programs. But there was a workshop earlier this month where they actually stated that for the Clean Cars for All program, they 
are going now to 300 FPL, and we would like to request that those two programs remain uh, consistent with the eligibility requirements. And the second reason is because based on the current uh, funding allocation for this program, it would only uh, help about 17,000 applicants purchase an e-bike or half of that amount for a cargo bike. And to put it in perspective, the uh, Public Policy Institute of California estimates that there are about 6 million Californians who live near, in or near the poverty level, which shows the, uh, the range of um, the need for this program. And so therefore, we, we ask that you consider lowering the income limit to ensure that this limited funding goes to support the households that need these incentives the most. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tyrone Bell, I've opened up your line. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Ty Bell. I'm with the Monterey Bay Air Resources District. Um, so I actually wanted to speak on a couple of items. Uh, just real quick, the class three, I agree with everyone else that uh, I would support not excluding class three e-bikes for all their reasons. And also I wanted to point out a lot of e-bikes are multiple classes. So a lot of e-bikes can be a class two or class three with a simple setting that they can switch on their e-bikes. So I guess the question there is, would that eliminate class two bikes that are capable as class three bikes? Because that would probably eliminate a lot of potential e-bikes. Um, as far as uh, vendors, uh, local vendors, um, I, I support what you guys are suggesting with um, having one of those criteria met uh, keep keeping the dollars local to the state. Um, one question I would have is what a definition, what is an e-bike retailer, right? Uh, some companies sure only make e-bikes, but many companies such as Trek have conventional bikes as well. So the definition of e-bike retailer, what is that exactly? Um, also like stores like Walmart, Best Buy, they sell e-bikes, right? Are they considered e-bike retailers? <laughs> Uh, just, just a clarification on the definition uh, would be great. And also, um, I want to also mention or speak on the um, the idea of additional incentive for e-cargo bikes. Same thing. What's a, what's an electric cargo bike, right? What's the criteria? Because there isn't a standard definition. Every manufacturer is going to define their bike types and categories however they want. Like you look at mountain bikes. I see... Just because it does it have a suspension, is that considered a mountain bike? Same thing with cargo bike. Does it need a rack, uh, a trailer, what have you? And on top of that, like I don't necessarily think an additional incentive is necessary for cargo bikes. The e-bikes are expensive as it is. I don't think it's really fair. Or um, and then maybe that seven fifty could be used as the uh, woman before me spoke to incentivize other people um, rather than you know, kind of giving people who buy a cargo bike an extra 750. Um, I think that pretty much covers it. All right, thank you for your time. Thank you, Ty. Thank you. Um, next person would be Kyler Blodgett. I've opened up your line. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you all. I appreciate this opportunity to speak. I'm here with People for Bikes, the National Trade Association for the Bike Industry, and I appreciate what you're doing for the accessibility around interpretation and other things, so thank you. I have two comments and then one question. Um, the first comment is just adding to the chorus of voices about re-including class three as eligible. Um, we know that it's not the bikes themselves that are inherently dangerous. It's certain inexperienced riders uh, that aren't aware of bike etiquette and trail etiquette and safety. Y'all might be aware that AB 1946 was just signed by Governor Newsom a few weeks ago and this directs the California Highway Patrol to develop safety guidelines and training programs for e-bikes by next fall. So we think it's preemptive to exclude class three before the state has had a chance to roll out what's really more of an education problem than it is a mechanical or a bike problem. Um, secondly, uh, to the point about, you know, how to navigate this tension between online retailers and the service available at local bike shops. I just wanna point you all, you may be aware of uh, Denver's recent e-bike application where they have an online application to sort of vet uh, online vendors to make sure that it's, uh, you know, parts that can be easily uh, serviceable and that there's kind of a quality. So it's not just any, any bike. Um, 
you know, being bought through any sort of un unvetted online application. So I think that there's a possible middle, middle ground there. The question is, you know, I really love how this program is built with low income community members in mind. And I just don't want to make the assumption that the program is going to market itself. You know, how do you see envisioning marketing of this to low income community members? And do you know how the program administrator is thinking about this or how much of their funds are dedicated to making sure that people who wouldn't have otherwise bought an e-bike are like this is actually an incentive, not just a cashback for someone with the means who already was going to do that. So if you could speak to that, I would definitely appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Kyler. So I actually do want to say um, for that for that bill 1496, um, we're actually already working with CHP. Um, we're, we're meeting with them on a regular basis to to help them and also learn from them in designing the safety program. So you know, thank you for highlighting that. Um, I also want to say that for the online e-bike retailers, this it when we open it up um, to eligible retailers, it doesn't mean that every retailer will necessarily apply to be part of this program or that will necessarily they'll necessarily be included in the program. Those are just the minimum requirements. Um, I can't really speak more to that because obviously the program hasn't launched and we're still trying to onboard our um, our administrator. A grant has not been signed yet. And so we're unable to do any work with our grantee until that grant is signed. Um, as for the outreach work, I know that we will definitely, I know that the, the grantee will definitely be part with working with and leveraging the access network um, through, you know, cause we have, you know, we have the benefits finder and, and other, um, and other uh, things like that. But I, and I don't have it off the top of my head, the budget that was dedicated to their outreach, but it was, it was significant. It wasn't a small amount. Does that answer all your questions? Or does that answer your question? Um, yeah, it, it does. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Um, our next speaker will be Conrad uh, Jacober. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a point as someone who qualifies for the program and who is looking for, uh, you know, bikes that might qualify, um, that I would also uh, add my voice in support of removing the class three uh, exclusion. Um, as someone who's looking for a bike with a torque sensor, uh, it is exceedingly difficult to find um, torque sensor bikes that are not uh, class three bikes. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I hope the that you all consider removing that exclusion. Um, I also, you know, think, um, you know, CARB supports a lot of programs that helps people bike cars uh, that can go faster than California's highest speed limit of 70 miles per hour. And so I, I would hope you would consider um, how, how odd the kind of paternalistic attitude is towards e-bike riders that doesn't exist for people who buy cars. Um, and, you know, if I could add a question, I just want to ask, um, could you give us some insight into how you might decide or advocate on this exclusion, uh, given how many people in this forum have spoken against it? Um, Conrad, I'll be honest, it, it given all of the 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 pushback on the class three e-bike um, exclusion, it's it's looking we're definitely going to go back and reevaluate, but um, I don't want to commit us to anything just yet, but we will probably remove that proposed exclusion. Uh, just given you. all of the all of the pushback that we're getting, right? This this these were just suggestions. This wasn't you know, this is what we're coming to you with, and this is what's set in stone. This was really just a starting point to to have this discussion. Okay, that's a huge relief. Thank you. Thank you, Conrad. Um, our next speaker will be Gavin. Gavin, your line's open. Hey, thank you. Uh, yeah, my name's Gavin Feiger. I'm with the Lake Tahoe Bicycle Coalition. Uh, thanks to CARB for bringing this, you know, this this 
opportunity forward. We've been eyeing it for a couple of years here as it's, you know, the rumors it's been developing. Uh, my, my question and comment is about the disadvantaged community definition. Uh, EnviroScreen is not favorable to much of rural California, especially the Sierra Nevada and a lot of Northern California. So is there an opportunity to, um, I guess, expand that definition, maybe to include you know, AB 1550 areas, uh, free and reduced school lunches, some other criteria that could help uh, much of rural California uh, be eligible for this program, especially with long distances between amenities, communities, and workplaces. E-bikes are a great option for us, but uh, just basing the, the disadvantaged community off Cal Enviro screen is going to make a lot of our communities ineligible, um, along with the combined with sticking with the federal poverty level as the income basis. So if, if there's some room to expand the eligibility areas, looking at some geography, that would be really helpful for us. Um, thanks, for, thanks for doing this. Uh, thanks, Gavin. That's definitely something we can look into. Um, and just, you know, thank you for bringing that to our attention. Great. Thank you so much, Gavin. <clears throat> uh, Mark Wall, I've opened up your line. Thank you. Um, I will hopefully bring a little bit different perspective. I live in Tulare County, California. I'm uh, also a, a longtime manager of uh, rural transit agencies, particularly some with low incomes. Uh, having managed transit there, I, I kind of understand the situation both with Cal Enviro Screen and with uh, uh, the situation of rural counties with respect to the availability of bike shops to service bikes. Um, currently, I'm on the Clary County Association of Governments Active Transportation Advisory Committee, and I do outreach for our local bike clubs. Um, a couple of things, uh, rural counties, a uh, number of them uh, don't even have a bike shop. So online retailers are important for them. On the other hand, I feel strongly that there needs to be some uh, evidence that online retailers will support the continuing maintenance of those bikes. Um, as far as outreach goes, local bike shops are very aware of uh, this program. Uh, here in, in my area, uh, I've talked to the local bike shops. They've known about this for quite some time and they're anxiously awaiting the program. Uh, and I, I don't think an awful lot of outreach will be necessary. Uh, the um, I wanted to comment also on class three. As somebody who rides rural roads a lot or in suburban areas where uh, bike lanes aren't always consistent, being able to get up to a fairly high speed, I think is a safety factor for the bicyclist to uh, be seen for a longer period of time by motorists coming up behind. Uh, I know that when I'm on some of these roads, I ride as fast as I can. Uh, so that I will be seeing it. And one of the things I would say about this is that uh, the speed differential between cars and bicyclists is important. Uh, there's been studies that show that uh, a speed differential over 20 miles an hour is off, almost always or often fatal. Uh, if it's below 20 miles an hour, the cyclist has a much better chance of survival. So if we're talking a city street with a, a 40 mile an hour limit or uh, 45 miles an hour, uh, that extra few miles an hour is important to be seen. And if they are hit, that they have a better chance of survival. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, electric vehicle uh, programs. Some of them have a reporting feature where uh, the car owner continues to benefit uh, by reporting. There's incentives for them to keep reporting. And I don't know if you're planning that, but I think it would be very helpful as far as uh, having data on how much these bicycles are being used for commuting and other purposes. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Our next speaker will be Camille. Camille, I've opened your line. Hi, um, 
okay, I have a couple comments um, and questions or uh, suggestions, I suppose. Um, one of them is, are, is any of this funding going to be used to um, put, purchase or put in charging stations? Um, as a e-bike rider, and that's my sole transportation, as a single mother, it's my employment, I use it for everything. There have been so many times I've been stranded because my bike has died and there's nowhere safe to leave it. So, which brings up the question of, will MTS be adapting more for, um, to be able to tr transport like fat tire bikes? Right now it has to be under, it has to be like two inches is, is as big as it can go on the bike racks. Um, and also like secure bike parking somewhere because the bike is only as good as it is when you have it. <laughs> if it's gone, it's gone. And um, they're stolen like crazy. Um, so that's um, one thing. And also regarding the cargo incentive, um, I do think that that is very important. I think that that's gonna be much more um, likely that people will be able to give up their cars <clears throat> because um, they'll be able to get their families groceries or transport their kids to school, things that you know maybe are their main reason for having a car. Um, so what about like if they had a, un and I understand the problem with defining um, a cargo bike for sure, so what if they had like a, you had like a universal thing, like depending on the person's need, if they were needing to transport their children, well, the seats that you add on, like I have a red power bike, the seats are like $250 for one kid's seat. That's very expensive. But if you guys maybe bought them in bulk or something and people could have them if they needed to transport their child or a, tra a universal trailer. So it was a standard, like for anybody that needed for employment for like housekeeping, gardening, painting, stuff like that, or delivery baskets, if they're delivery. And that would take so many cars off the road too. So just some suggestions and comments. Thank you, Camille. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Michelle Go. Michelle, I've opened your line. Hi, I'm Michelle Go with the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. Um, I had a comment regarding online retailers. Um, so some of them, for example, Rad Power, offer a variety of self-assembly or professional assembly options, um, whereas brick and mortar stores, uh, professional assembly is assumed. So I would suggest um, that you require professional assembly and make it an eligible cost. Um, that's something we're doing with our equipment. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Um, I think I see Camille next on this, but Camille, you. No, I'm, I'm done. He got okay, me already. Okay, Thank just you. double checking. Okay, our next speaker will be LaDonna Williams. LaDonna, yes, good morning. Oh, yep. Okay. okay, good morning, LaDonna Williams, all positives possible. Um, a lot of the questions that I have uh, actually were kind of answered with the previous callers, um, but particularly with the disadvantage, I was concerned, and we've been voicing our concerns too about uh, Cal and Viral Screen in that that gentleman, I believe it was Gavin, but I may have written the wrong name, um, where he mentioned that their communities or the communities he serves, according to Cal and Viral Screen, they're really no longer um, qualify or eligible according to this new Cal and Viral Screen. So that was one of our concerns of what we were hearing as far as um, certain areas that won't be able to qualify under this program. Um, but there was also questions about, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to write my note, uh, read my notes. My handwriting is horrible about insurance. And I don't recall any mention of the cost of insurance. If you guys have any information available on that. And if you factored that into the cost when you were having the, um, questions and the surveys, is that how you came up with those amounts? as well as the maintenance issues? Um, so we, when we were coming up with the amounts, we did think about the insurance and the maintenance um, and also what um, 
our comparable incentives um, throughout the country. So that's sort of how we came up with those potential incentive amounts. I'll be honest, I didn't actually get to see the results of the poll <laughs> because I was I was looking at my notes. But um, after this after this call and in the coming weeks, I'll definitely be reviewing the the poll and the outcomes of that and we'll adjust the incentive amounts as necessary. Oh, okay. And and I was questioning particularly for uh, disabled or, you know, those with special needs and of course um, the below poverty or severely financially um, struggling families. Yeah. I wasn't, I'll be, I wasn't able to to see that, to, to look at them because I, I was focusing on my notes, but I will definitely, when we, when this call is over and as we're continuing um, our work on this and then for the next um, work group, I'll bring back the results of that and let everyone know what, um, what was voted on. Okay. Like Lisa probably wants to add something as well. Yeah. I, was okay. say, I, I can put the results back up to any of the questions. If, okay. if you'd like me to do that, if that's helpful to see them again. Yeah, it would be. It would okay. be. So the question in particular, I it was question um three and four, I think is the one or I think are the ones that she was referring to. Okay. So question three is the cargo bike question, the adaptive bike. And the result, these were the results that came up was um oh, okay. Like, yep, this identified uh that most folks were in favor of the base incentive plus about 750 to support adaptive or cargo um, type modifications for bikes. And, you know, I, I'd like to add too for folks, you know, there's there's a couple of things, questions that we've received even from, from participants offline, which is, um, you know, that in some cases these aren't enough and to, to really subsidize the bike. The key thing is, our goal with the program isn't to pay for the bikes outright. It's to provide an incentive as we've kind of worded these questions, what's the lowest incentive that we can offer that would encourage you to um, adopt an e-bike? Um, so we're not we're not looking to fund the entire bike, but we do definitely want to make sure that we are covering enough of that incremental cost to make it worth somebody's um, interest to move in this direction to use an e-bike. Mm -hmm. um, so that's you know just to kind of answer potentially some other future questions coming. And then I will stop sharing this one and I will share the next one, which was, um, this one is um, the lowest that we should consider for providing additional funding to support the um, lowest income tier of 225% federal poverty level or mm -hmm. an applicant in a disadvantaged community. Um, and as we can see here, that one also folks suggest that we look at a higher incentive amount. And I'll also caveat that to say that the results of these polls are really just to help inform us. So we will, like Aria said, be taking back this information and looking at what other information we have. As we've stated, you know, we are, we don't have a ton of data. Um, to go by when making these decisions, which is why we've been putting these ideas on the table, trying to get everybody's kind of input, and we're looking for the data to help support these things. So if there are things that um, that folks have identified, whether it's studies, reports, or raw data of some kind that you're aware of, please feel free to pass that along to us. We'd love to see it. Uh, are there any other question results you guys would like me to put up as well? For uh, me, that's it. Thank you, though. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thanks, um, Aria, would you like me? Let, why don't I do a review of one and two as well, just for folks that maybe didn't get to see those while I have this up? Yeah. So the first question had to do with just asking, should we provide a larger incentive um, for based on income or based on disadvantaged community? And it looks like overwhelmingly um, there is strong support for um, a, a larger incentive for those criteria. Lisa, they're not on the screen. The oh, results of that are not on the screen. There we go. Apologies. There was one more button I needed to click and I missed it. Thank you. So yes. So again, uh, the the poll from participants today showed kind of overwhelmingly um, support for a larger incentive amount based on income or disadvantaged community residency. And then let's go to the last 
other question here. Um, so this question um, is uh, kind of that base question of what is the lowest incentive level most likely to encourage you to purchase an e-bike for your local trips instead of using a car. Um, and this kind of, this is a pretty good spread across the, the top three. I think what this tells us, and as we understand is that, you know, a $500 level is probably gonna be a bit too low. Um, and there's a pretty, pretty broad support here for something right around a thousand dollars. That's really helpful to us as we go back and look at the cost of vehicles um, and what does make sense and what, how far we think we can spread the dollars that we have identified for this program. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing these and hand it back to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. We have about seven more raised hands, so uh, I'm going to move on to the next one. Um, Dorothy Mitchell, I've un unmuted your line. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm curious if there is a definition in place yet for the adaptive bike part of the um, of the incentive. There, there is not. Um, that's something that we're still researching. Um, it was something that was um, specifically called out um, in the in the budget bill that uh, that basically appropriated the funds to us. Um, so th there's not something there's there's not an actual definition yet. It's just something that was called out. Okay, that's good to know. I'm I'm sure you're looking into it, but there's there's certainly lots of you know adaptive bike rental, um, you know, type of establishments up and down the West Coast that would probably have a, you know, good, um, good experience with defining, you know, what are the different types of adaptive bikes people are looking for besides, you know, people in the actual adaptive community that could give you some feedback. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, our next raise hand will be Patty Breslin. Hi, my name is Patty Breslin with San Leandro 2050. And <clears throat> I guess these are comments, but essentially um, I uh, would say that for me, the most important part of this is uh, the ability to support folks in um, getting used to even cycling at all uh, and how to ensure that they do have access and know how to <clears throat> get their via, their EV bikes um, serviced and where to do it. And so there's a there's a huge educational piece here that that is, um, I think, going to be really, really important. Uh, and then the second thing is that I question what the outreach is, not on the bike shop side so so much as the community side and what that outreach will look like. Um, I know for Clean Calls for Cars for All, it's been a little bit bumpy and it would be great to understand a little bit more about that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Patty. Um, so for the outreach on the consumer side, we, um, you know, our, our, our grantee Pedal Ahead has laid out a plan on how they're going to get the word out. We also plan on um, working with Access, uh, Access Clean California and their benefits finder to help, you know, get the word out. Um, Pedal Ahead does have a success, like has a proven success record with, um, like, you know, in, with their with their program down in San Diego and partnering with CBOs and we expect and that is their plan to partner with CBOs statewide to help get that word out. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, our next person in line is Lizette Walker. Lizette, I've opened your line. Lizette, you'll need to unmute yourself. Okay, um, Lizette, I'll, I'll move on to you next, but I'm gonna go to the next person in line if you're not available. Um, Ken Bradford, I've opened up your line. Hello? Oh, I was sorry. Actually, going back to Lizette. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I'm the parent of a daughter with a rare genetic syndrome uh, who used to, and she's she works, but she gets SSI and she's low income. She used to ride a regular bike and she um, 
lost that ability due to some knee injuries. And she isn't able, she, she used to be able to ride around for pleasure, go to the store, go to medical appointments, et cetera. And she can't do that anymore. I'm not sure if the e-bike program has what she needs. She's also lost the ability to ride buses just because of the change in schedules. So she's now on paratransit. She just keeps losing independence. And I'm looking for a way for her to get back some independence, but she won't be able to ride anything that's two wheeled. She needs a three wheeled and she can't do pedal assist. So is this, is there anything in your program for her? Lizette, I'm, you know, thank you for reaching out. I'm, I would really like to take this conversation offline because I don't think I'm going to be able to okay. answer these questions on the spot. Um, okay. Bianca, if you could, can you put my email in the chat? It's aria.berliner at arb.ca.gov. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm operating with a broken arm and I can't I, write either. So. I get it. And I'll, and you know what? Don't even worry about it. I will look out. I'll, you know what? I will, when we get the attendee list, I'll send you an email. Okay. So, thank so you so much. You don't much. have to worry about typing anything. I'll send you an email and we can set up a call. Thank you. Thank you, Lizette. Um, our next raise hand is uh, Ken Bradford. Ken, your line's open. Thank you. Um, yes, I am uh, an e-bike rider and also the owner or co-owner of, of one of the largest e-bike retailers in the Sacramento area. Um, and yeah, well, to answer some specific comments from earlier, um, and as far as rural areas, uh, you know, people drive up to a thousand miles to get an e-bike that they want. This is, you know, for a one-time purchase. I understand service is an issue in rural areas, but it is for online purchases as well. Anyway, I will, um, I have, and then to answer Lizette's comment, yes, as I understand the current program, it will, um, it will cover what your daughter needs. And the, uh, another gentleman asked about uh, class one e-bikes with torque sensors, and, and there are plenty of those on the market now. However, uh, to get my comments, number one, the exclusion of class three makes no sense for all the reasons we've already been mentioned. Um, number two, as far as outreach, you know, we bike shops in general, we know how to reach our current clients and people who look like them to a lesser extent. We do, we are not good at reaching people who don't look like us and who might need this and who this program is focused for. So I, one gentleman said, you know, oh, well, maybe we don't need the marketing component because bike shops are all over this already. Well, yeah, but we don't know how to reach the people that this program wants to reach. So uh, we'd certainly welcome help with that. And number three, the whole thing about cargo bikes. Yes, they are more useful. They're more expensive. Uh, defining a cargo bike is very tough. They're sort of semi-cargo bikes and three-quarter cargo bikes and super big cargo bikes. And you know, that's that would have to be defined much better because if the lines are blurry and getting blurrier, there are all sorts of things in between that and a quote unquote regular bike. So that would have to be worked on. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker will be Jean Severinghouse. Jean, I've opened your line. Thank you. Um, good day. Um, I've ridden an e-bike for eight years and a couple of things. One is service is critically important. Um, so I support your requirements for some kind of an in-state presence, especially a great idea to attach um, it to, like Rad Bike has done, they've put, they've actually put um offices i mean uh retail, retail locations where you can take your but you can get it built and you can take it and i support that cost also being eligible um also they're heavier bikes so you need to have the brakes maintained much more often than a regular bike so it's and then if you get a junkie bike it's going to break down and not be fixable so having it attached i like your program it's, it sounds that sounds good second thing is 
I'm really concerned about um, an incentive being too low and then incentivizing buying really junky bikes. And that's not going to help us all as a state move forward with climate change. We need to incentivize buying good quality bikes. And if a good quality bike costs $2,000 to $3,000, an incentive should be half of that. An incentive should be at least you know, $1,200 or whatever. You, it's not an incentive to give me a little pot of money when I don't have any money to buy a bike at all. So please increase your incentive to something it, that's much more in line with what a good quality bike in the market costs. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Uh, our next raised hand will be Jeff Tillman. <clears throat> Jeff, I'll open your line. Uh, yes, uh, to the guy that just uh, was on the line here, happy to help you there. Um, I would love to talk to you about reaching the people. I uh, actually can help you with that. I handle, I do marketing and I'm in California in the Monterey region. But my question to you area is, do you guys uh, offer helping uh, partnerships programs? Because I, I have a program that I'm, I would like to get started with helping get more awareness on the bike, bikes, bikes out and up brought to disabled area, um, dis um, disadvantaged people. Because I have a nonprofit that I would love to see if potentially work with you. Um, I'm really sorry, I don't actually understand. Can you repeat the question? My question is, do you guys provide um, a platform of a partnership? with these incentive programs that you guys are putting together. And to the gentleman that was speaking a moment ago, if you need assistance with uh, any, or anyone on this call needs assistance to reach out to people, to I'm happy to help. Thanks, Jeff. This is Lisa. Um, that's really helpful. And, and yes, there are definitely partnership opportunities. Um, once we get our administrator on board, that would be the first um, opportunity is to kind of connect you with them and and we can actually help get that conversation going now awesome. um, but then also connecting you with the access clean california program which is our um our uh kind of one-stop shop and and outreach hub for all of our vehicle purchase incentive programs and so um, connecting with them, you can learn a little bit more about some of the other programs that we fund and what the outreach looks like generally for these programs. And so that would be another really great connection to make. So yeah, um, yeah so just feel free to reach out to, to REI and we're happy to put you in touch um, in, with those. Oh, thank you. I, Cause I, I'm, I'm on your, I, I've been on your site a few times, Ariane. And it's like the information is fairly vague on who, how to connect. So yes, I would greatly appreciate that assistance. Yeah, no. Um, sorry, our contact information is on the last slide of um, oh. <laughs> um, this presentation, and it is posted on our website. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. All right, our next speaker will be uh, Edgar Arlana. Edgar, I'll open your line. Oh, Edgar, you'll need to unmute on your end. Am I good now? Yes. Can I? Yep. All right, cool. I uh, just want to mirror some of the comments uh, mentioned before around cost of the e-bikes. Um, yeah, the incentives sometimes just force for lower grade type of um, things being set up out here. Um, another thing that I, I'm connecting with a lot of bike shops to learn what are some of the needs to support bicycling and electric bikes in the area. And there's capital improvements like electrical lifts and stuff that are needed for shops to accurate or, or adequately and safely maintain these bikes. Um, one more thing was, uh, oh, the education piece. Um, as I'm looking through some of these programs or, or grants, uh, education may seem like a, a hindsight or, or a, a secondary thought. Um, however, a lot of the riders that are going to use e-bikes tend to be first-time riders. So I would hope that we put uh, increased value to having the educational portion really be built out 
at present, um, I, I am also a league certified instructor with the League of American Bicyclists. Um, they are developing the e-bike stuff, but for the majority of classes available, they are still on standard bikes. So that incentive for more education that is appropriate for electric bikes and pushing it even further, um, since CARB does have uh, electric vehicle incentives as well for cars, um, if that education can permeate into that realm as well so that there can be a ecosystem of sharing the road uh, among both, both new users. Thank you. Thank you, Edgar. Thank you. Um, and we have four more speakers. Um, uh, these are folks that have spoken once before, but um, I'm going to open up the line for uh, Dwayne Strauser. Yeah, just a quick follow up. Um, I've already spoken, but on the issue with uh, qualified physical storefronts, so that's been brought up several times, uh, being a, a bike shop owner for all of these years, we do encourage you to find some way to um, show a certification that a retail storefront has qualified certified uh, repair services available. And I'm only bringing that up because we do have two locations in Nevada County alone that have now opened up that are selling e-bikes only and they are low quality bikes and they do not actually do repair. So we, the other retail shops in the area that service the other big brands are getting those bikes coming in for repair. We can't service them. So make sure that a retail, retail storefront truly is that with qualified uh, mechanical uh, services available because um, we invest quite heavily to have our mechanics go back to schooling from the manufacturers online with rad for example since they don't have a physical presence but uh, we get trained on how to do that so we can maintain both the bikes that we sell as well as other outside uh, brands so there has to be just some way of quantifying a storefront um, beyond the fact that they simply have a sign up and a door to walk in that's all Thanks, Dwayne. Thank you. Um, next in line, uh, Jonathan Weedman. Jonathan, your line's open. Um, Jonathan, are you there? Okay, um, I'm gonna move over to Tyrone Bell. Tyrone, I've opened up your line. Oh, uh, <clears throat> hi, thank you again. Uh, so I just actually had some questions this time, uh, and maybe this was answered and I missed it, but uh, one, is this a rebate program, it sounds like, and is there any consideration for as a voucher program? It's it's an on-the-saddle incentive, so it's a point of purchase incentive. Oh, oh great. Fantastic. Um, okay, so that was question one, and then uh, I also had a question about, uh, there's a lot of discussion on the vendors or the retailers. Have you guys considered just coming up with an authorized retailers list? And that would just simplify it for everyone, including the applicants. We know who we can shop from. Yes. So that is that is the plan. Um, and so that's what that's what that's what I had was saying before is that just because um there are uh businesses that are eligible doesn't mean that they're necessarily like in the program. Okay, cool. Um, and then uh, this is more, maybe more of a comment or sharing our experience here at the Monterey Bay uh, Air Resources District with our e-bike incentive programs. Um, we, uh, and there's a lot of discussion on pricing and incentive amounts. So what's the right amount? Uh, first, I want to point out, it's it's kind of, uh, there's probably a clever phrase for this, but asking the, the incentive, the person receiving the incentive, how much should we give you? They're going to, they're going to probably ask for a lot more than what's, what they would really accept, Right. Um, and there is some research, uh, one put out by Portland State, uh, which I could share with you guys, uh, which they surveyed the national e-bike programs, and most are around $200 to $400. I'm not saying that's the right amount, but just to kind of put things into perspective, uh, we're here, we're sitting here talking about up to $1,500 here. Um, and along with that, with pricing, we did uh, enforce a minimum purchase price. Uh, of a thousand dollars for the same concern that uh, others have voiced in the in the quality of the bike, we want to ensure uh, the bikes that we incentivize were going to remain on the road and in use. Um, and also, we're concerned about maintenance and whatnot. We don't want someone to go to Costco and get a two hundred and fifty dollar quote unquote e bike. Um, 
So that maybe that's something you guys can maybe look at, um, like a minimum minimum purchase price. Uh, and I, I do think the incentive amounts that's that's these are great amounts. Of course, I wouldn't turn them down myself if I was eligible. But uh, I think we we're kind of like really starting to creep up. Whereas the one lady had mentioned, the program's intent isn't to straight out buy bikes for people, right? It's an incentive. So what what's going to encourage people to make that transition? You know, e-bikes for most, it's 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 not a need. It's a luxury item. Right. Um, and I do appreciate it's a great tool for people who haven't been able to drive or use other transportation services. I've uh, spoke to plenty of our applicants who fall into that category, either they're disabled or, or seniors and and can't drive or, um, you know, they, they're, the riding a traditional bike isn't really feasible for them at this point in their life anymore. So I do think there's great value in that as well. But uh, it is an incentive program. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you for your time. Thanks, Ty. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna open the line for Sandy uh, Brambilla. Sandy, your line's open. Hi, um, I have well, two questions and then a comment. First, um, how are you defining a disadvantaged community? Um, so that would be defined by uh, Cal and Viroscreen. Um, and I can't give you a link right now just because I don't have one, but um, if you search Cal and Virus Screen 4.0, uh, that'll, it'll come up with all of those communities. Okay, okay, I'll, I can I'll put do in that. a link. Thank okay. you. Um, and then um, I'm just curious about how the points are going to be distributed statewide. My understanding is that the grant is for 10 million and that may seem like a lot of money and frankly it kind of is, but for our state, California, which is huge, um, it's going to go very quickly. And my concern is that smaller communities will be overlooked in favor of larger communities. Um, I'm hoping that the bulk of the money doesn't stay in San Diego since I, I'm aware that the um, partner is based in San Diego. Uh, thanks, Sandy. This is actually a first, this, as of right now, the way that we're intending to launch this program, it will be a first come, first serve program. So anyone who is eligible throughout the state can apply and um, receive that incentive. So it's up to the interested person yes. to, to, okay. Oh, interesting. Um, okay, and then my third, um, more of a comment, um, is there any thoughts uh, to compiling a list to help beneficiaries um, of the program select a good quality bike? Many are gonna be first time bicycle buyers, first time, definitely first time electric bicycle uh, buyers. Um, and they may not know how to select um, a good quality bikes. I, for example, I bought a, a Copenhagen wheel a couple of years back and um, it's still working and um, it's been good, but it's no, Copenhagen wheel is no longer in business. And once that wheel stops working, my, I won't have a, an electric vehicle anymore. They're no longer in business and they no longer service these, um, these wheels and there's no parts to be found anywhere. So is there any um, criteria for that so that bikes that are purchased don't become e-waste in a couple of years? As of right now, we haven't we haven't gotten that far, but that is something that we'll definitely consider. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna open the line for um, LaDonna Williams. LaDonna, your line's open. Yes, good morning again. Um, I just, uh, I, I'm glad with the last couple of callers, I kind of raised my, my um, concern again. And you just mentioned this is a first come first serve program. Is that what I heard? Yes, that is how, hmm. that is how we are starting it. Um, okay. And obviously, so it can it can evolve into the more the needs based model that I know that you're about to hint at. You you dog all right. I'm getting ready to go there, and I was just gonna say, do we not learn from the mistakes of the past or lessons learned that did not work? Well, I guess it worked for those that have the income and those who feel like these programs are not. Uh, necessities that, you know, this is sort of like a, a luxury. 
Um, but there are populations that this is a necessity for them. This does make, you know, the, uh, give them the ability to function in society, uh, you know, helping decrease the burdens that they would have. And I think one of the parents spoke on it earlier, trying to find a way to help her daughter remain or maintain some sense of, you know, self um, care and, and um, independency. And it's really just kind of disappointing to hear. Overall, I, you know, I appreciate the meeting and the various comments, but to still hear kind of that elitist tone in here, you know, and then to hear first come first serve says, we're about to repeat the same mistakes we made in the past. So my recommendation is let's not do that again. And if possible, we need simultaneous programs going on together where you are not going to miss the uh, communities that really need the support and the help in this. And they don't get overlooked. They don't get um, uh, pushed to the side because that's what happened where you allow Tesla to come in and get 90% of those funds um, and the communities that needed it the most was basically 1%, if that, being able to utilize these programs. You mentioned disabilities, we talked about that. We see that Cal Enviro screen is missing the mark on that. So we're, we're you know, a, addressing that issue as well. But I think you really, really are gonna go down this same path that's gonna have us coming hard at you guys. So better to look at it now rather than get into the trenches and, and see like, oh my God, we made the mistake again. Let's not do that. Thanks, LaDonna. And I do want to point out that this was the legislative direction that we got, and this was how the project was solicited. But we we don't disagree. Like we like you know I, I've I've worked on I've worked on CVRP and I've worked on the financing assistance pro programs, and you know I I don't disagree with you. And that is something that we will continue to look at. Right, and and I think too, you know, with CARB y'all can't keep pointing the fingers at, well, this is legislative. This is, you know, that this is the charge that they gave us. Yet, when we go to the, to the hearings where you've got, you know, the legislative folks, there calling you guys poverty pimps, something there, there is a miscommunication going on somewhere. So somebody needs to do a little more deep reading to see what kind of charge they are giving you. But clearly some of the stuff I've read says you definitely have to accommodate and support those that are disadvantaged and underserved um, within those charges. So it's, it's unfair to the populations that keep falling through the cracks and end up missing out on the opportunities to say, oh, well, you know, this is legislative. Well, clearly then we need to go back to legislative folks and say, hey, you've given us this charge. You're throwing us under the bus by giving us this charge. And then when we look at the numbers and asking where did the disadvantaged funds go or did you serve that community? And you guys are back at square one again and four or five years have been lost in this process. So better to handle it up front now rather than on the back end. Yeah, thanks, LaDonna. That's totally fair. I think, you know, the way we had kind of started out looking at this was since it was funded through CVRP, we kind of started with that initial model. Um, but I think, I can't remember which slide, Aria, maybe it's slide four or five. I think we fully recognize that if we do start with the first come first serve model here, that it will be, it will be temporary. We will absolutely, we have every intention of moving to needs-based as we kind of see how that unfolds in the other programs. Um, I think the biggest challenge was timing on this one. And, you know, ultimately what we solicited based off what we had at the time, um, since we don't have needs based up and running yet, I, I'll say, well, I don't, totally don't disagree with you. We, we're getting a lot of pressure to get this program open. And I'm, I, we're still figuring out the needs based stuff. And so, um, we figured let's get it started, learn from what we can, at least just for this first amount of funding and then absolutely refine. And, and again, I, I hear you loud and clear. We'll continue to go back and think about this and figure out 
what the best and right approach is, because we know this isn't going to open tomorrow. We do still have a lot of work to go. Um, so we'll go back and continue to think about it. Okay. Well, I just want to say this last thing, though. Again, if you guys are intent on schedule, we just got to get something out. Again, the most vulnerable communities are left behind with this model that you guys are intent on moving forward. And so if it is intended to benefit those who are financially more able, then okay, then that's what we call it out to be what it is. But I think again, it makes communities like ours fall further and further behind because it's always like, okay, we're gonna handle this first and you guys sit on the side and wait and then we'll get to you, it's wrong. That is against everything that you guys claim to be, which is this agency who highlights and includes uh, the most disadvantaged. And you talk about, you know, fairness and, and equitable uh, programs and how to be inclusive and, and this all approach. Again, you're creating further disadvantages at the way that you guys are approaching this. So let it be known it's on record. Thanks. Great. Thanks, LaDonna. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker will be Denise Lynn. Denise, I've opened your line. Hi, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Hi, I'm Denise. I work at the City of Mountain View, and we are also looking to um, have an e-bike program likely next spring. And I wanted to ask how CARB is planning to coordinate with local governments and I think I read before that the program would be layerable. So I'm wondering what is the thinking behind the layering? And for example, you know, if Mountain View were able to give a resident $1,000, but then they were um, to qualify for $1,500 um, from CARB, then would there be some system to help residents um, get that remaining $500? Um, so that's my question on layering and also um, what is the estimated timeline? So I know how to coordinate with you all. Thanks, Denise. And I just want to clarify by layering, do you mean like stacking so that if someone gets the carb incentive and they also get, say, the carb incentive is $1,000 and then the Mountain View incentive is $1,500, they would get a total of $2,500? Um, yeah, that's more so my question. Okay. Yeah, I, I think there are some things in your draft program design that are additive, for example, where it's not finalized yet, but we so far don't have an addition, for example, for cargo bikes and for the um, uh, additional for the two, 225 um, FPL, for example. So I just wanna make sure that, you know, if our program came out first, that our residents wouldn't be at a disadvantage to not be able to get that full amount. So um, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm not sure how we would do something like that um, right now, um, where we're at with the program, but I would love to take, um, I'd love to discuss this more with you because I, I'll be honest, I hadn't heard about the Mountain View program until just now. Um, Lisa, it looks like you have. Something. Yeah, you know, one, one really great approach here, kind of similar to um, an earlier commenter is to connect you both with the um, administrator once we've got the administrator on board and also Access Clean California because Again, what we're trying to do with Access Clean California is offer opportunities for consumers to come in and learn about everything they're eligible for and get that case management support to be able to access all of the programs, whether they're CARB funded, you know, whether um, whether they're not, um, and build those partnerships across the programs so consumers that qualify for these programs can maximize what they participate in. Um, so connecting you there uh, now would be great. And then continuing to kind of work with us as we bring the administrator on board, I think would be the next best step. That sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker will be Nish Anderson. Hello. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Mish Anderson, and um, I am a recent, um, the second uh, pilot person, actually, recipient in uh, Southern California Air Quality Management District's uh, Replace Your Ride program, uh, which involves a car swap and uh, is also income based to determine the incentive amount. Uh, and uh, so I recently got my e bike and um, have been. Uh, trying to work with, 
with the um, management district to uh, do a really good launch of, um, of the program, uh, including the e-bikes for the last couple of years. Um, it's having the e-bike incentive is a game changer for a lot of people and especially for women. Um, it just gives us another option and more power on the road um, to do our daily lives um, with our kids and take care of our families and each other. Um, I had a couple of things. Um, the first one is um, I, I just want to um, agree <laughs> more vocally um, with the need to have really good marketing and information out there for uh, reaching out to all the potential audiences um, who uh, could benefit from this program. Um, there isn't a lot of information out there. There's already a lot of um, there's already a lot of sort of societal bias against cycling. People think that it's just a, either it's a recreational thing for spandex people, uh, spandex clad people on Saturdays and Sundays, or it's uh, just for kids. And so we've got a big lift in order to open people's minds to the possibility of it actually being a reasonable, practicable and fun uh, method of transportation in our daily lives. Um, and I think it's really going to take a lot of um, very wide and thoughtful marketing um, to reach out and change those notions with, with all the communities that we want to get to, uh, which is everybody, of course. Um, <laughs> um, and I was really listening um, carefully to um, LaDonna's um, comments um, as I've been um, an advocate for safe streets, especially for pedestrians and cyclists for some years now. And, um, and the questions of, um, of equity are you know, really big and can be very thorny. Um, so I wondered, um, I, I hear the complaints um, that LaDonna was voicing and the concerns, and I wondered um, what are some potential um, answers to that? You know, what are some solutions, whether um, I would love to hear from LaDonna again, um, if she has some suggestions for how to amend the structure of the program so that um, her concerns are met. Um, I wondered whether CARB has, you know, any experience or thoughts on that as well. Um, and um, since legislation is one of the barriers that's been raised, um, is it, you know, maybe an idea for um, LaDonna and other advocates with those concerns to maybe work with a policy advocacy group like CalBike to identify a legislator who can uh, put forward the kind of amendments to the legislation that, um, that we need in order to meet this um, equity question. Thank you. Thanks, Mish. Um, so uh, let me start first. And I'd love to, if LaDonna is open to it, love to kind of bring her back on too. Um, so, you know, the, the history of some of our vehicle incentive programs is that, uh, you know, we were we were funded starting first in clean, um, sorry, in CVRP, the Clean Vehicle Rebate Project, funded really for mass ZEV adoption. And then several years ago, we started to fund more in the equity space. Um, but it's been slow uptake. And as LaDonna has pointed out, we've heard from many communities um, that awareness hasn't been there and opportunities haven't been there and the funding programs close um, because the funding is kind of gobbled up by consumers that come in and buy the more luxury or more expensive vehicles. And so over time, we've tried to tailor our programs towards more kind of lower income, uh, looking at you know disadvantaged communities and so forth. And that's kind of why those are two main criteria in this program. Um, but what we're doing in some of our other programs is moving to um, a needs-based uh, mechanism and to attempt, it, that's, it, it's our way of attempting to see if we can, if that will help, because we, uh, you know, I'll be honest, and we've talked about this with LaDonna too, we get this charge to get these dollars out there and get them spent. And um, we know we've had some breakdowns when it comes to outreach, and we are trying to work on that and trying to really connect with as many local community representatives about these programs as possible, because we know that's a really big component of it. But then also the structure, like are there better structures? And so needs-based would basically have a consumer come in and who is interested and we would look at their kind of base criteria 
And if they meet special criteria, like they're the lowest of the low income and, um, or they, and they live in a disadvantaged community, or they already participate in other um, social programs like HUD housing or things like that, then that would, we would automatically reserve funds. We would connect them with a case manager that works with them one by one to really help them cross the finish line. And so it's a more resource intensive approach, but one that we think is really important for those communities that haven't been able to access the programs before in the past. Um, and so we've been trying to develop that in some of our other programs, and we are hoping to launch that after the first of the year in our statewide financing assistance program and in our statewide clean cars for all program. We're going to kind of test it there and then we'll bring it out to the other programs as we know kind of what works and what doesn't work. Um, and so that was, I think, some of what LaDonna and I are alluding to. Um, and so that's kind of the direction that we're heading, but I'd love to see if LaDonna, because you were always definitely open to more ideas of how we can improve in these areas. Um, so LaDonna, I think is your line on? Yeah, it is. Looks like yeah, it. They, they unmuted me. Um, I think really, again, that's a, a larger conversation. I think we'll end up taking up the rest of the meeting. Um, but the most important thing is ensuring I know you keep talking about um, waiting for, you know, the uh, grant to be assigned to the administrator and what have you. And again, when we look at the pattern of, of how we got missed, you know, throughout the 12 years with the original programs in itself, um, it's important to ensure that community based groups who have the relationships are, and are in the communities are included in this funding source of being able to get these outreach dollars and the engagement in education component. Short of that, I think, you know, this is a, this would be another workshop within itself to be able to have to cover those issues. And who, who was the person, I kind of only wrote the first name, it looked like it was Mish. Was the person's name? Yes, Mish Anderson. Uh -huh. Okay, are they with the agency or are they community-based group? Um, I think we have your line open too, Mish. Oh, okay, hi. <laughs> um, no, I am just an individual. I do not work for any agencies. Um, I am a recipient um, of the CARB Clean Air um, for All program mm -hmm. um, by consentive. Um, I've been a volunteer with the Pasadena Complete Streets Coalition. Uh, which is a grassroots all volunteer group of people. <laughs> We're not even a nonprofit uh -huh. um, for some years. Yeah. Um, oh. And um, so uh, not, not really an official person uh, in any professional circumstance with this, just, just a community member. Oh, that was asking, yeah, because you were the one that was asking me direct questions, right? So I was just yeah. wondering with you, so you were able to volunteer and you were able to utilize the program, but would you consider yourself in the category of disadvantaged or underserved? Um, that's kind of a complicated question um, for me. Um, I did qualify for... Um, for a large incentive um, in this program because it was income-based and I had low income at the time. Okay, and, um, and that's the point. Yeah. It, to me, it should be no shame in if you actually qualified for that and needed to be able to take advantage of that program. That's mm -hmm. great, that's who it's supposed to serve. However, the problem is, is those incentives and opportunities don't usually hit our communities until the funds are all eaten up right and so you know that's yeah. why you hear us pushing the way that we do and, and actually mm -hmm. we shouldn't have to be the ones doing that it really should be agency identifying that hey if we're talking about this all approach and by that i mean we all should have access to the same you know funding and opportunities, but the reality is that we don't all have those opportunities because by the, again, by the time it hits my communities or the communities I serve, the funding is gone. Mm -hmm. And so um, anyway, but again, Lisa knows we've had a number of conversations about it and we will continue to have those conversations 
to sure to ensure that these communities do not get left out again. And that's in this beginning phase. It shouldn't mm -hmm. be in, you know, the second go round. It should be yeah. at the beginning. So as much as possible. Yeah. I mean, all of these these programs are always iterative, right? Like we do what we can from the beginning with um, you know, with what we've got and you know, keep trying to improve it and improve it as uh, as we identify, you know, new issues and some of the things that we try in the beginning don't don't work um, or could work better if they get new ideas from the community or inside uh, agency staff. Um, so there are a few things that kind of come to mind um, uh, as I'm as I'm listening to you. Um, so it sounds like maybe like a combination of of um, approaches to um, to reach the community faster and more effectively uh, could be used, um, like just the communications and, and marketing outreach from the beginning um, could be really uh, fine tuned and pushed uh, out to communities in lots of different ways, uh, much better. Um, that's one idea. I've found that there's very little outreach at all for the program that I just participated in, <laughs> um, the car swap program. Um, and, um, and there's still very little um, information out there that the e-bike incentive is now available. Um, so I have been really pushing um, the agency to um, to really make the e-bike incentive, um, you know, front and center of their car swap program, <laughs> instead of this sort of small note that is followed with no other factual information or useful um, information in the rest of the online information. Um, another thing is that I also identified a lot of sort of the uh, of practical barriers to um, people being able to apply for the program. Um, I am one of the lucky ones. Um, I am fluent in, in English. Um, I am educated. I had the time to be persistent with my application and actually get this through. <laughs> um, and, um, and I also had sort of the technical um, tools to do it as well. But for people who don't have the kind of access to a personal computer that I do, who don't have the time and persistence and confidence to push um, for their application, to talk to um, the consultants who um, my case manager um, and work as actively with her as I did, um, who you know maybe are not as fluent with the language as I am. You know, those are those are all advantages that that I have, but that we have to really, you know, I think we have an opportunity to really look at those, those aspects and make sure that people who don't have those advantages can just as easily apply for the program as, as anyone else. Um, and it, is it, this still Mitch that's talking? Yeah, it's still me. Oh, okay. It just, <laughs> Sorry, I'll try on to my be more screen, it, it shows you as muted. So I didn't know if someone else had joined in or not, but oh. Oh, I was just okay. going to add those recommendations yeah. and the comments that you're making are exactly the same things that we have shared with mm -hmm. uh, CARB in our mm -hmm. previous interaction with them on these programs and this first, first come, first serve. And that was the reason why I had asked you as well if um, you were considered disadvantaged or, mm -hmm. you know, were in that uh if you were able basically to take advantage of that program, as you said you were, but right. all of those things that you outlined absolutely gives you an advantage that many, I'm not saying all, but majority of the communities and the folks that we serve don't have those tools to be able to utilize the program the way that they need to. Yes. Yeah. 100%. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to jump in really quick. This is, I want to thank you both very, very much because I think that this is, it's really important in this type of dialogue. I think it's, it's rare. We don't typically open up multiple lines, but I think it was a really great kind of back and forth and um, general understanding about 
where that baseline person is that does have access and is able to utilize these these programs versus where we know folks folks can't. And I think overcoming those barriers, trying to get rid of as many of those barriers as possible for the consumer that doesn't typically have access is genuinely something that we we want to be able to do here. Um, and I think that there are, it's a multifaceted issue and um, one that we're going to continue, absolutely continue to work on. Um, so I, I really thank you both for taking, taking the time to make the comments. You're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, we have a couple more people um, with their hands raised. Uh, I'm going to open up to Tyler Blodgett. Tyler, your line's unmuted. Uh, thanks. I know I've already spoken, so I'll make this quick. I just wanted to say, you know, as a representative of People for Bikes, I wholeheartedly second what LaDonna and Misha are saying. There's only one chance to launch the program. I understand the iterative nature and that you all are in a pinch. You know, this is a highly visible program um, with a high dollar amount behind it. So people are looking to you right now to get it off the ground. But there's only one chance that I think if you miss it, it will be hard to rebuild trust with the most marginalized communities in the second or third or fourth rounds. Um, and for perspective, I just wanted to say, you know, there's currently, I think it's five states that have, or have recently authorized uh, statewide incentive programs. Given the talks we're having legislatively, I bet within two years, that will jump to 20 or 25 states. People are gonna be looking to California as a model, both legislatively and on the implementation side of this. So anything you can do to bake in that needs-based perspective into your approach, will pave the path for states that are coming down the road afterwards. So I just wanted to say that, thank you. Thank you, Kyler. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Justin Hu, uh, Justin Hu and Wynn. Uh, I've opened the line for you. Hi, um, I'm Justin Hu Nguyen uh, with the Campus of Bicycle Coalition. I think, yeah, just supporting what everyone has been saying, I think we really have to put equity at the forefront of this program and really make sure we're reaching communities really intentional. I mean, this is a fun, this is like a pretty transformative groundbreaking program. We want to make sure that communities feel like their needs are being served first, right? Especially communities that, that are historically disadvantaged. I think too often times at the end of the line for a lot of these programs, and we really want to make sure that this really feels built around and meeting them where they're at and really make sure that outreach and, and partnerships are really, um, are, really, uh, are really established and thriving. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Um, Laura McCammy, I'm opening a line for you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thanks. It's Laura McCammy from CalBike. I just have a couple of more um, questions sort of going back to things that were discussed earlier um, relating to class three and the amount of the incentive. Is there going to, is there an age limitation for eligibility? Like, is this for people over 18, over 16? Could you, someone buy a bike for a younger, an e-bike for a younger person through this program? Um, so I was really hoping we didn't get this question because <laughs> it's not something that we've, like, it's something we've talked about a little bit internally, but it's not something that we're ready to bring yet to, um, to make a decision on. Okay. And, and then the other question I had, the um, clean cars program includes, you can use the, the vouchers there to buy gear such as helmets, lights. Um, I know electric bikes don't generally need lights because they come uh, installed, but helmets seem like a really important thing. Is there, I, I know these vouchers may not even be enough because it is probably not enough to, to pay for an entire bike, but if somebody wanted to buy a helmet or some other gear, would that be included? Um, that's not something that we have uh, discussed yet, but it is something that we are thinking about. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I'm gonna open the line again to uh, Lizette Walker. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I really appreciate the comments I've been hearing about making this more available to lower income people who have difficulty. Um, and I had a question about what what this meeting or who this meeting is, is aimed at. It seems it's mostly agencies, hardly any individuals, and it's not at a time of day when 
individuals can usually participate, like my daughter is at work, uh, so I'm her advocate. Um, are you going to have a, a meeting where you talk to individuals? Um, so these these meetings are open to the public, um, but individuals are free to email me um, or or call me um, during during office hour, like during during business hours, I guess. Um, and I can when I when I reach out to you, Lizette, I can give you all of that information. But really, I mean, why should I be put on a one to one thing? Why shouldn't the meeting be a meeting that covers questions like what I have? So uh, this is Lisa again. Um, so we we can absolutely answer the questions that you have in this meeting if we have a good answer. And I think the question that you had asked earlier was whether or not we would have bikes available or on the list that can support um, your daughter's needs. And we don't have an answer to that question yet. And I think what we need to do is understand your daughter's situation a little bit better. We did hear from a, another um, a commenter that uh, there definitely are bikes available that can support that. And so we would wanna make sure that as we're developing our vehicle eligibility list for the program, that we are including those types of bikes. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I, I think that's really just why we couldn't answer and offer okay. an answer to you just yet. But to answer your okay. bigger question about participation. So we hold these meetings. Um, these meetings are, again, like Aria said, these are open to the public. This is a this is a public meeting. It's our opportunity to kind of roll up our sleeves and hear what individuals have to say, whether you are representing a community or representing an organization or representing yourself. Um, it's an opportunity for folks to see what we're thinking about and give us some input so that as we continue to go back to the drawing board, we can design a program um, that is well informed um, and well thought out. So this is a pro it's a process for us. And so I'm oh, sorry, but no, how do you do that when you have it during business hours when people are at work? So th that's a great question. So we hold our meetings at various times. Uh, we hold different meetings at different times. And so we had our last meeting was actually an evening meeting for this particular topic. So they vary. Um, it all depends on when other meetings are taking place. This is just one program of many that kind of compete for time on the calendar. So we, um, you know, we try to hold, um, you know, we have a couple meetings during the day, a couple meetings in the evening. It just varies on when we get can get the meeting on the calendar. Um, not all meetings can work in the evening for all of our participants, just as not all day meetings can work for our participants. So we do okay. try to offer um, a balanced approach for that. Okay. Then I just want to emphasize again and appreciate the comments of that people have made that um, there are these very low income people, but who work very hard. She's worked 22 years at a job and um, fall through the cracks for all of these programs like housing. She doesn't make enough to get any housing unless it's going to be rental. You know, she wants to be, she wants to be like everybody else. She'd love to own a little place and she wants to be independent, but she's always falling through the cracks and the only reason she has anything is because I'm a strong advocate. So I hope you can find a way to find people like her. Thank you for that. And, and we definitely want to. And I think um, building our partnerships with smaller grassroots organizations, um, some of the organizations like LaDonna represents, some of the other organizations that we, that we are talking to um, that want to help gentlemen that spoke earlier, um, that's what we need. We need to know who we're missing um, and find those organizations and communities. I, I will be honest, and I'm, I, I try to be very direct in these meetings that I don't know how, you know, as, as a bureaucrat and somebody that runs these programs, I don't know how to reach the individual community members until somebody helps connect us. Well, I, I do. So great. when we talk later, I have some ideas for you. Well, that would be wonderful. That, but I can tell you, once we're connected, you won't get rid of me. So let <laughs> you know, I, we're, we're happy to connect, and I'm, I'm happy to make sure that that you're connected to the right people, and that we are able to reach your daughter, so she isn't falling through the cracks any further. 
Okay, thank you so much. You bet. Thanks, Lisa and Lizette. Uh, B, um, we have time for one more raised hand. Okay, um, the next person who hasn't gotten to speak yet is uh, Tom Lent. Tom, I'm op open the line. Tom, are you there? You have to unmute yourself yes. as well. Yes, hi. Okay. Yes, you can hear me now. Great, I want to talk uh, briefly about cargo bikes. I continue to think it's important to provide additional incentives for cargo bikes. But in line with all this discussion that we've had late in this call on the, on, on the needs issues, I think it's important to figure out what we're trying to accomplish with a cargo bike add-on. And we should think careful about why we want to spend the extra dollars on cargo bikes versus going to more incentives and be targeted about it. Um, which I think might be even a little more than just thinking about what a cargo bike and you know, what the definition of a cargo bike is. So that's part of it. There are, of course, many use cases for cargo bikes, um, but I'd suggest that one important goal for this particular program be to make an e-bike a practical car replacement for low-income families with young children. Um, that would point both toward potentially an eligibility requirement of, you know, of one or more young dependents um, under 12, um, probably, and you know, we're, I mean, we can touch on that, but that's the, you know, that idea. And a technical requirement that the bike be designed to be able to carry two or more young passengers, um, that, you know, which would exclude some of the little mini cargo bikes that are, you know, that it was a, the way the cargo bike um, definition is being broadened to make sure it's really designed to help that parent with kids. Um, with or without the cargo bike enhancement, I'm given, but given the expense of bike seats, I think it also might be worth considering suggesting an adder specifically aimed at bike seats that again would have you know, that same criteria of being for families with a with young dependent. Um, so that may be kind of self-evident. So that's that's just a few thoughts on the cargo cargo bike issue. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Um, so I'm going to move, continue moving uh, the slides through um, just because we only have about four minutes left in this presentation. So I wanted to start with the timeline. Uh, we're aiming to launch this consumer facing program in the first quarter of 2023. We don't actually have time for any more Q&A, so I'll move on to the next slide. Our next steps, um, we're working on getting the administrator on board uh, once they are onboarded. Uh, we will work with them to develop terms and conditions as well as the process for applying. We'll hold another work group later this fall to finalize program parameters. Uh, finally, we'll, we'll work with them to develop the application platform. And definitely please keep an eye out for the Gov delivery notice of our next work group. Um, please feel free to contact myself or Lisa. Our emails are on this slide. If you haven't done so already, please um, subscribe to our listserv. All Gov delivery announcements for this project go out using that listserv. Um, thank you for joining, and we look forward to talking with you soon.